Hello students and welcome to our video covering subspaces of RN, a topic in section 3.2 of your textbook. So jumping right in, I'd like to start with a little motivation. So RN is our prototypical vector space. So like R2, R3, we've been drawing vectors in these places all the time. These are where vectors live. They are our vector spaces. Um, but you might wonder, okay, well, what about the xy plane in R3? I mean, R2 is an xy plane, and we've got kind of a copy of R2 in R3. Does this count as a vector space, just the plane by itself? Is this copy of R2 and R3 a vector space or not? And what we're going to want to do is say that it's a subspace. So in some sense, yes, R2 is a vector space, and if you find a copy of it somewhere, it's still going to be uh, its own vector space. Um, and But if you find it in R3, we'll call it a subspace. So this is um, yeah, kind of just motivation for a, a technical definition of a subspace that we're going to see. So in general, uh, we have the following definition. This is pulled from your book. So a subset W of Rn is called a linear subspace. Most other books would call this a vector subspace, but um, you see both. But OK, so a subset of a vector space Rn is called a subspace of Rn if it has the following three properties. One, that subset contains the zero vector. Two, that subset is closed under addition, which means if you have two vectors in that subset, adding those vectors together, will you'll stay in that subset. And then three, it's closed under scalar multiplication, meaning that if you have a vector in that subset and you scale it by some arbitrary scalar, then OK, that scaled vector remains in the subset. And uh, I'll just say, it might not be obvious that this actually captures what we um, maybe we're talking about completely. But uh, at the very least, it should be clear that uh, the xy plane really does count as a subspace of R3. Like it certainly contains the zero vector. Any two vectors in the xy plane, add them together, you're staying in the xy plane. And scaling a vector in the xy plane, it'll stay in the xy plane. And if you need some sort of uh, algebraic reason, um, any vector in the xy plane is going to have zero as its third component. So adding and scaling is going to leave that third component zero. Um, so certainly the uh, plane that we were talking about counts as a subspace, but maybe other things do also. So let's um, explore this. Let's work with this definition a little bit and see kind of what it allows and what it doesn't. And just before doing that, I just want to acknowledge that yes, that first uh, that first condition is redundant, because for part C here, if your set is closed under scalar multiplication, then scaling by zero should keep you in the set, and scaling by zero gets you to the zero vector. So this is uh, yeah, it's redundant, but it's here because kind of in more theoretical context, it's actually a nice kind of quick and dirty check: do I have a subspace or not? I don't know. Does it contain zero? Uh, but OK, let's see this subspace definition in action. So uh, the first example your book gives is uh, maybe somewhat surprising that actually the image and kernel of linear transformations are subspaces. So you have some linear transformation. Its kernel is going to be a subspace of the domain of the transformation. And its image is going to be a subspace of the range or the codomain. Uh, I think I will prove that the image is a subspace and let you, uh, for homework, prove that the kernel is a subspace. But if we're going to prove it's a subspace, first thing we got to do is check, is zero in the image? Well, you just think about where the any linear transformation would take the zero vector. Well, linear transformation is just multiplication by a matrix, and any matrix multiplied by the zero vector gives you the zero vector. So yes, the zero vector is going to be in the image of any linear transformation. All right, if we have an li arbitrary linear transformation, is the image closed under addition? So v1 and v2 are in the image. Is v1 plus v2 also in the image? Well, I want to start by saying if v1 and v2 are in the image, then 
that means some vector gets mapped to them. That's just what it means to be in the image. So I claim there must exist some vectors w1 and w2, such that t times w1 is v1, or not times, but uh, t of, and t of w2 is v2. And this is just because v1 and v2 are in the image. Then, all right, consider v1 plus v2. Like, we want to show that this is also in the image, meaning we want to show something gets mapped here. Well, by what I just said, all right, v1 plus v2, that's going to be tw1 plus tw2. And then because our transformation is a linear transformation, the sum of the transformations is equal to the transformation of the sum of the vectors. And so, yes, v1 plus v2 is in the image because it's what uh, w1 plus w2 gets mapped to. So, okay, it's closed under addition. How about scalar multiplication? If we have some vector v in the image, is kv also in the image? Well, uh, just as before, if v is in the image, some element w gets mapped to it. So there has to be some vector, vector w such that t of w is v. And then, all right, well, let's consider k times v. We want to show, is this in the image? Well, k times v is equal to k times tw from what we just said. And then because the transformation is linear, scaling the transformation is the same as taking the transform of the scaled vector. So yes, uh, turns out image really is a subspace. Good, your book didn't lie to us. Uh, let's try another example. Is this subset of R2 a subspace? So this is X and Y all vectors x and y where the components are non-negative. So if you uh, ponder this for a minute, you uh, I hopefully will agree that this gives you the first quadrant in R2 with uh, including the x and y axes and the origin. So, all right, is the origin in this subset? You betcha. That's what these equal signs get you. Is w closed under addition? Well, geometrically, if you just kind of pick two vectors and you add them together, it certainly seems geometrically like you're going to stay in w. Um, a more algebraic proof of this is that, all right, if the components are non-negative, then adding two vectors with non-negative components is going to keep you with non-negative components. So definitely closed under addition. What about scalar multiplication? Take some vector, Certainly, if you double it or triple it or multiply it by 5 million, you're going to stay in there. But uh, if you multiply it by, say, negative 1, you pop out. So actually, w is not closed under scalar multiplication. So in fact, this w is not a subspace of R2. So what do subspaces look like? Well. If we are looking, say, just of R and R2, uh, there are no three-dimensional subspaces of R2, maybe not surprising. The two-dimensional subspaces of R2 are just R2 itself. Uh, now, if you think for a second, yeah, I guess R2 does satisfy the definition of a subspace. Like It contains zero, it's closed under scalar multiplication, it's closed under addition. Um, so, okay. Technically, it's a subspace of itself. Uh, more interesting, the one-dimensional subspaces are lines through the origin. So this is like your x and y axes, but also any line, any line such that it goes through the origin. This is kind of like your copies of R1 in uh, R2. And then, actually, the zero vector counts as a subspace it's as of <laughs> counts as a subspace as well because all right zero is certainly in there and then the only other things the only thing in there is zero so yeah scaling zero by anything leaves you with zero adding zero plus zero it gives you zero so yeah closed under scalar multiplication and addition so these are our sub what subspaces of r2 look like and r3 all right a subspace uh, r3 is a subspace of itself and then these kind of copies of R2 and R3 um, show up as planes through the origin. Copies of R1 through R3 are these lines through the origin. 
and I don't know, maybe you want to think of the zero vector as a copy of R0 through R3. Um, but uh, so certainly our definition captured this notion of copies of lower dimensional versions of Rn, um, but it's actually only capturing these. And that's maybe not obvious. Uh, your book gives you an argument for why this is true in R2, but um, we're just gonna accept that it really does, that definition really does what we want. These are the only subspaces of R2 and R3. And um, maybe you can make a guess as to what subspaces of R4 would look like. I want to end with just a little food for thought. So um, in example three on page 124 of your textbook, he asks you to consider the plane V in R3 given by this equation. Now, one, I just want to say, this is certainly the equation of a plane uh, in R3. Also, because there is no constant term, this is a plane that goes through the origin. So this plane defines a subspace of R3. And then your book says, find a matrix such that this subspace is the kernel of that matrix. And then it asks you to find another matrix such that that subspace was the image of the matrix. And um, you might wonder, like, is that possible? I mean, they're telling you to do it, so it must be. And I do encourage you to look at how they do this. But what I think is interesting is, um, is it true in general that if you have a subspace, it can be expressed as the kernel of some linear transformation? Or similarly, if you have some subspace, can it be expressed as the image of some linear transformation? Like always, can any subspace be expressed as a kernel and as an image? Uh, yeah, something to think about. See you in the next video.